I want to welcome everybody to Build and Release Confidently with Continuous Integration and Delivery. If we haven't met before, my name is Steve Grunwell. I'm at Steve Grunwell on all the social networks that matter. Um, if you prefer your own copy of the slides to follow along with, you can grab them now at stevegrunwell.com slash slides slash intro to CICD. If you don't grab that now, don't worry. It is at the bottom of each and every slide along with my Twitter handle. I'm going to immediately regret not putting my phone on do not disturb mode. What is this, amateur hour? Boom. Okay, here we go. So, at a high level, let's take a look at what we mean when we talk about continuous integration and continuous delivery. What is CI-CD? So, continuous integration, the general idea is that we're able to check at any time if whether or not our code fits or integrates uh, with the larger code base. Now we do this by defining a number of scripts and scenarios under which they should run. This can be especially important if you're working on a team with multiple developers, people doing things in different branches. You need to make sure that they're all going to come together and developer A isn't just totally going off the rail and breaking the stuff that developer B might be working on. Um, Continuous integration can take a few different forms, um, but generally speaking, these can be any sort of tests you want to run. These can be automated tests. If you want to run through PHP unit, if you want to run through your Jest tests or whatever you're using for JavaScript, if you want to run Behat, if you want to run uh, full-on NN tests, you can do that here. We can also do things like check for coding standards. If you're using PHP Code Sniffer or ESLint and you want to make sure that your code adheres to the guidelines and the, the rules you've set out, you can do that. We can also take advantage of tools for static code analysis, things like PHP Stan, um, or in the Laravel community, we have Laristan, which is just a PHP Stan tailored for Laravel. Um, these can help us catch some things in our code that maybe we would have missed otherwise, um, and can be kind of a nice second gut check. Best of all, these things are always going to be run. You're not going to have scenarios where a developer was in a rush, so then they said, oh, whoops, I, uh, I forgot to do that, and now suddenly the build is broken. You have this acting as a gatekeeper. Ah, the jokes are strong. So <laughs> continuous integration acts as the gatekeeper for your pipeline. If any check fails, nothing else moves forward. As a nice little side bonus, uh, the computer is the bad cop in the scenario. You don't have a situation where you go up and you say, hey, Tom, uh, yeah, you, you broke stuff, it's really bad, or like this is just unacceptably terrible code. You have a computer, which is just a cold, soulless machine saying, error, something is wrong, and the computer rejects it. You don't have to be the bad guy. You can just be, oh, sorry, it wasn't, wasn't me. It was the computer. Um, and as someone who's non-confrontational, that's always a really big plus. Continuous integration also lets us uh, remove some of the artifacts and dependencies from our repositories. If we're using tools like Composer, NPM, Yarn, etc., we want to make sure that we're not versioning stuff that's already being versioned elsewhere. We have a composer file saying, I want this ver or dependency at this version. Um, there's no reason to keep that in our Git repo. Let the con uh, continuous integration pipeline put that all together. When I say artifacts, I'm also talking about anything that might be generated. Remember, source control is meant to be for the source. If you have a bunch of JavaScript files, but you're using Webpack, and you're saying, great, take all of these files, compile them down, concatenate them, minify them, all of that stuff. Those files are artifacts. They do not belong in your source control. You're only concerned with tracking that original source. This is going to reduce the incidence of uh, merge conflicts. You're not going to have like, oh, well, this minified script is having a hard time merging with that minified script because they're just not in there. Um, you don't need them. They can be regenerated at any time. Let the computer do what it's good at. Now when we talk about continuous delivery, this is the idea that we're able to deploy our code on demand. At any time, uh, we can click a single button and say, great, go to production with this code. Every necessary script throughout the process has been scripted, uh, or every necessary step, rather, has been scripted. So deployments are as painless as just clicking a button. And again, by scripting everything, we make sure that nobody's missing a step. It's all written out. It's going to deploy the same way each and every time. CD can have a second meaning, though. Um, I'm talking more continuous delivery, but there's also this idea of continuous deployment. Uh, I really like this tweet from Carl Kahn. 
uh, that says continuous delivery doesn't mean every change is deployed to production as soon as possible. It means every change is proven to be deployable at any time. So when we take these two different CDs and stack them up like it's the 90s, continuous delivery, we're going to have some manual step to deploy. Um, there's going to be some human intervention. Whereas continuous deployment, as soon as you push it out, as soon as all of those tests in the CI pipeline pass, it's going to be like, great, I'm going to go ahead and roll this out. Now, your pipeline or your workflow might use a combination of both of these. Uh, you may be continuously deploying like on your staging branch and you say, great, as soon as all of the checks pass on staging, go ahead and roll it out to the staging environment. We don't care. Whereas you might have, we want one step of human intervention, <clears throat> someone to click deploy before it goes out to prod. Um, because even if it's ready to be deployed, maybe there are other people you need to coordinate things with. Maybe it's a, well, we really don't want to roll out new code because that requires clearing out caches and right now is like our big shopping day. You don't want to roll stuff out on like Black Friday and be like, oh no. Um, so it's not uncommon to see both of these in play within the same application across different environments. Uh, it's really popular for developers to talk about how we should never deploy on Fridays, but that fear really feels misplaced. Continuous delivery means that we can deploy anytime we want to because we've automated this process. We're making sure that it's going to follow the exact same steps each and every time. That doesn't mean we have to deploy on Friday, but we should feel comfortable doing it. And if you are still nervous about rolling out on a Friday just because it's Friday, um, maybe it's that deep-seated like, oh, well, I keep seeing memes like this on Twitter, or maybe it's the situation where, well, sometimes we roll it out and stuff just doesn't work the way we expect it to. That should be a red flag. That should be an area that you go, okay, why are we not confident about that area? What are the areas that are breaking? How can we address that to make sure that we can confidently deploy even on a Friday at 4.30, 5 o'clock p.m.? The goal of continuous delivery is to be able to deploy with confidence. If you don't want to be afraid of those Friday deployments, it's important to have confidence in the tools you're using. Um, really, deploying on a Friday should not give you nightmares. It should not cause anxiety for you or your team. It should not cause people to work on weekends. <clears throat> so, let's talk through now uh, what it looks like to set up a CI CD pipeline. At a, a high level, a pipeline, not unlike the internet, is a series of tubes. It's the route from development to production and anywhere else that it might land. Um, it covers what steps it needs to take, what gates are in place to make sure that bad code doesn't make it out there, and different branches may end up having different paths. Again, with staging, it might be as soon as staging passes all the tests, it rolls out. Maybe you don't have to do you know, big end-to-end -end tests on staging because you're like, well, that's resource intensive, we're not as concerned, but we absolutely want to do that stuff before we roll out to production. Um, there are a number of good CI CD providers out there and they're all going to offer um, a pretty similar yet varied uh, set of offerings. Um, has anyone in the room worked with Jenkins before? Okay, I'm so sorry. I'm sure like once you had it set up and if there was someone dedicated to just making sure Jenkins was working, it was like, oh, this is amazingly powerful. I made the mistake while I was working at a startup a few years ago of saying, well, we're going to use Jenkins because why not? It's the power of Jenkins. Um, but I didn't want to spend much money. So I spun up Jenkins, which is written in Java, by the way, first red flag, on a $5 a month DigitalOcean box. I have no Java experience. I put it on an under-resourced box and expected this thing to just kind of continuously run. I'm spoiled. I come from the PHP community where we can have applications that don't require, you know, like they're not the sarlacc of resources, uh, and they can just kind of run in perpetuity. Uh, this turned into a case where I had to SSH in about every two jobs and kick Jenkins and be like, hey, dude, wake up, um, because it was just memory leaks everywhere. Um, that was on me. That's not on Jenkins. I've seen it work beautifully, uh, just not when I configure it. If you don't want to maintain your own Jenkins server and drink yourself to death, you might consider tools like Travis CI. This is really popular uh, for people who are working on GitHub um, and open, in the open source space because Travis traditionally has been free for open source projects. Um, there are also some great tools, CircleCI, CodeShip, DeployBot. Um, 
And then some platforms will even provide their own tools. Uh, Bitbucket has its pipeline set up. And then what we're going to be looking at today, which is GitLab. If you haven't used GitLab before, uh, it's going to be very similar to GitHub. It's a, a source code management tool, but they then take a bunch of cool features and build them in. Um, GitLab can also be run both uh, on GitLab.com or you can create your own installation. Uh, so like at work, we have a private one locked behind a VPN. Um, so we can have unlimited repos and unlimited resources and our, our DevOps people have to run it. Um, because again, don't let me actually run the CI service, just let me configure if that makes sense, yes. Um, but one of the really nice things about GitLab is that it has a really robust suite of continuous integration and continuous delivery tools um, free to you out of the box, even on the gitlab.com free tier. Um, and so we're going to kind of be looking at this. If you're not using GitLab, if you uh, don't have any interest in GitLab and you're like, oh, well, I really, I have a friend over at CircleCI and I really want to use their service, the lessons that we learn in this talk are going to be applicable. Um, it's just going to be a syntactic difference because, again, the general idea of we want to be able to run multiple jobs at once in a scripted fashion, this is not a new idea. Um, when we talk about GitLab's tools, uh, it's helpful to define some terminology. So GitLab's CI CD pipelines work in what are known as stages. Uh, by default, you're going to have three of them, build, test, deploy. But these are flexible. If you want to change things up and you need like a pre-build or you need like a, a post-deploy where you know it's like pinging Slack and it's uh, tweeting about it and, and all of this stuff, you can set that up if you need to. Each stage then in turn is going to be made up of one or more jobs. Um, a job might be something like run unit tests, run jest. Um, and if you, uh, the, the jobs themselves are carried out by what are known as runners. Um, basically, you're adding things to a queue. The queue workers come, pick things off, um, and execute those jobs. If you have multiple runners available to you, uh, you can run jobs in the same stage in parallel. Um, so you could be running your unit tests at the same time uh, that you're running your, your Jest tests, for instance. A typical pipeline, uh, this is for actually a Laravel app that I, I've worked on. Um, we have our build stage over in the first column here. I'll, I guess I have a mouse, so I can use that instead of a laser pointer. So we have our build column. I'm trying to watch the reflection in the window. Like, that's my monitor, which is awesome. Uh, so the build step here, we're going to install composer dependencies and our NPM dependencies. Pretty typical Laravel stuff. Um, as part of the install NPM dependencies, we might also then, we're doing NPM install and then running um, Laravel mix to build everything out. Next, we come to our test column, uh, or test stage, rather. It helps if I kept my cursor. <laughs> Don't follow the cursor. Uh, in this, we have four jobs. We're checking coding standards, so this is running through PHP code sniffer, um, and I think I had another tool in there. We're running Jest, we're running PHP unit, and then we're doing static code analysis via Laristan. If everything in there passes, um, we move on to the deploy stage. Uh, you'll notice there are two jobs here. We have deploy to staging, which we're just letting happen automatically. Um, once something hit master, in this case, we wanted to make sure it was actually going out, so staging was always being current. Um, but we have this, this nice little play button on deploy to prod. It's not actually going to deploy to the production server until we click that button. So we have that manual step. We're not you know, deploying it while we're like, the servers are already like completely hammered or something, or if we need to coordinate or, or whatever. For GitLab, the pipeline is configured uh, in the gitlab-ci.yaml file. Now this is a dot file, uh, lives in our repository, and one of the really nice things is that we're keeping our configuration as code, which means we can version it. We can create new merge requests, which are just pull requests, but in GitLab parlance, um, saying, hey, I want to change the way that this deployment is happening, and have it happen just for this branch first until things get merged in. Um, a simple job within this YAML file might look like this. So we're saying we want to install NPM dependencies. We declare the stage, so this will be part of the build stage. Uh, we give it the script, so in this case we're doing NPM install. Uh, I typically will do no progress, no interactive type stuff, um, just because that ends up cluttering the logs. 
and then npm run prod. So Laravel's, I want to build everything for uh, using Laravel mix um, so that it's ready for production. We're going to define artifacts. These are things that we want to hold on to after this job runs. Uh, in this case, we want to hold on to anything that it throws into the public directory, because that's where all the compiled CSS and JavaScript are going to live. Um, and we can also cache things. So we can say, hold on to node modules. So if we have to rerun this job, uh, or if nothing has changed, we're not like constantly hammering NPM to say, give us all of the things. We're able to say, just, just hold on to this stuff. Um, there are a ton of different parameters. Those are just kind of the basic ones. Uh, but we could use things like image in our pipeline configuration. If we want to have a pre-built Docker image to say, hey, pull this down and always use this for building our environment because it's already been set up with everything. Awesome. And you can customize this on a per app basis. Uh, we can do things like only and accept to make sure that we're only running it under certain conditions. Only run it on this branch. Only run it if the branch matches this pattern, for instance. Um, we can declare dependencies. So if one job needs to complete before another job is able to start, even if they're in the same, uh, the same stage, we can say, hey, uh, we don't want to have a race condition here. So make sure that completes before you try kicking this one off. Um, the full documentation for that is available through gitlab.com's documentation. Um, don't be thrown by the slash EE that they have in the, uh, the URL there. That's for the enterprise edition. But um, the configuration is is all the same. Uh, we are storing our configuration in code, but we don't want to be storing our secrets. We don't want to have a YAML file that has a bunch of like private SSH keys available in it. Uh, that's bad security practice. Uh, it will make you look dumb, and then people will judge you like so hard. So uh, GitLab does give us the opportunity to store secrets using environment variables. They'll get injected at runtime. Uh, so they're available to the, the runners, but these aren't exposed. Um, so in this case, you might see things like, uh, you know, production SSH key. Uh, I don't even remember what that one was. Um, target IP addresses for servers, all of that. Um, we can store all of these things uh, within our GitLab configuration and at any time go in and change it without being, changing that in the code and without hard coding those values in our code. Um, we can also mark them as protected so people can't just access them willy-nilly. Um, and we can mask them so they don't appear in build logs, um, which is always a handy thing to do. Um, so let's take a look at simple deployments. And I think this is kind of why Vince let me give this talk at this, when every time it comes to like, hey, how are you deploying things? And people are like, oh, I just SSH in and do a git pull. And I'm like, what are you doing? Um, I'm going to try to fix that. So let's, now that we understand how GitLab's basic pipelines work, um, let's see what it takes to actually deploy with our pipeline. Um, I liken this section to the, you know, the meme where it's like, how to draw an owl. Step one, draw some circles. Step two, draw the rest of the effing owl. Um, that's what it feels like with a lot of like getting started with CI CD tutorials. They're like, great, we're going to show you how to run your tests. And then we're going to show you like all of these advanced things. And you just like, people are like, I'm just trying to get away from FTP. Please just help me get away from FTP. Um, so let's take a look at just a very bare bones, um, replacement for what you may be doing right now. So the best place to start is looking at how you're deploying things right now. Because really what we're doing is scripting that process. So are you doing something via FTP? Are you building, I mean, I hope it's at least SFTP, but are you building files locally and then just dragging them up? Are you cowboy coding directly on the server? Um, maybe you're doing something where you do a git push, you SSH into the target server, you do a git pull. Are you building your dependencies there? Are you running Webpack on your production environment? I hope not. We can do better. Maybe you're living in the future and you're like, ooh, we're containerizing everything. We're, we're building Docker images. Cool. Are you building those Docker images directly on your machine? Does each developer say, oh, great, I need to Docker build and tag a new image and push it up to Docker Hub or wherever the repository is? Um, we can automate that. We can make this uh, much easier and make it consistent between people. 
So a drop dead simple deployment. This would be a replacement for like a uh, the SSH and Git pull combination or like an SFTP. What do we need to do? I mean, realistically, we need to build the application, make sure you know all of our JavaScript is compiled, etc. Um, maybe we can do something like, okay, great, we build all of that, we create a tarball, and we use SCP, secure copy, um, so basically copy over SSH uh, into production, and then maybe we take that into like a temp directory, expand it there, and rsync files into place. Like anything that's changed, let it replace. I mean, it's it's not beautiful. But it works. It's it's a pretty straightforward approach. So this might, I mean, this actually fits on a slide. Ship to production might look like this. We have it in the deploy stage, and the script is literally great. We're going to create release.tgz, so a gzip tarball um, of the the dist. Imagine we had like a composer build command or anything that just kind of says, great, strip out development related dependencies. Just give us the things we need to run the application and put it in a dist. Um, this could be copying from, from wherever you need it to. Then let's uh, SCP that tarball to our production server and throw it in the temp directory. Then let's have our CI CD service uh, SSH into the server, uh, the, the remote server, and this could be multiple servers if necessary. Um, expand the tarball uh, and then rsync the stuff into var www.html. Again, it's not the most elegant thing in the world but it works, and you're not using FTP. You're not SSHing and doing a git pull. And if you need to expand this and have it talk to three different servers that are all hidden behind a load balancer, you can do that. And you're not having to do this three times. You're able to say, great, go deploy to those three servers. We can take this a step further. Um, has anyone ever worked with a tool called Capistrano? Kind of, sort of, OK. Um, Capistrano is a really cool tool. I, I started using it back in uh, 2012. Um, it, it comes out of the Ruby community, um, but it has this concept of atomic deployments. And the general idea is we're going to have multiple copies of our application available to us on the server, and we're going to symlink in things that should be shared between releases. So the structure looks something like this. We have a releases directory, um, and typically each release in there is going to contain the timestamp of when the deployment happened. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a practical example in just a second. We're going to have a shared directory. This is going to share anything that needs to persist, so user uploads, configuration, uh, log files, all of that stuff. These items will be symlinked in to each of the releases. Um, so there's only one copy of your configuration file, but we're symlinking it. So we can change it in one place, and it's available and the same across all of these different releases. Um, but it lives in a shared directory. And then we have a symlink called current. And current is actually going to act as part of our web route. Uh, so it's going to point to whatever the current release is. Uh, let me show you this in, in practice. So imagine we have var www, and within that we have releases, and three of them. These are timestamps, uh, just Unix timestamps of the time of deployment. Somehow I deployed three times in three seconds uh, to make this a really easy example to follow. So the one ending in 01, the first one in the releases list, is the oldest. And 03, the third one down, is the, the latest. Maybe we're symlinking in stuff like a logs directory and config.json uh, from our shared directory. So we would be doing this as part of our deployment. And our current symlink is going to point to the latest release on the server. Uh, so as soon as we update this symlink, we just say, hey, Nginx, quickly reload. And it goes, boom. And we have a zero downtime or super, super near zero downtime deployment. It just switches over to whichever one we need. Now, say something went wrong. Say we rolled this out and 03 turned out like, oh, there was a bug in that. It's kind of crappy. We need to revert. We can update the symlink back to 02, and now it's pointing to the previous release of the code. Um, it's a really kind of ingenious approach. And rather than saying, great, we updated a bunch of files in place, it's like, no, no, no. Server storage is cheap, and especially if we're not having to copy like you know, large user uploads and stuff, just the application code itself, to be able to say, let's keep the latest three or five releases and be able to switch between them as necessary, that's pretty cool. Um, so the, the scripting for this, unfortunately, won't fit on a slide, but the general process is going to look kind of similar. We're going to create uh, our 
build and create the, the application, create a tarball, uh, SCP that over, start symlinking in the shared assets. Um, then we're going to move on and update that current symlink, quickly reload the web server, and then we'll probably want to roll off some of the older releases. Um, if this is something you're interested in, I do have a blog post that I wrote about this, uh, like, I think earlier this year. Um, so stevegronwell.com slash blog slash atomic deployments from scratch. Um, if you have the, the slides link, it's linked to from the readme for the slides as well. Um, so there's some, some code that you can steal and just lift into your project. Um, but please, please, please remember to roll off some of those older releases because I made that mistake a few times. Uh, and suddenly it's like, oh, why is the web server out of space? Oh, because there are 200 versions of the application all hanging out here. Um, so definitely make sure you don't skip that step. Um, but generally speaking, you know, keeping like the last maybe three to five on prod and maybe three on staging, um, perfectly reasonable. Application, you know, might be a few megabytes worth of code. Uh, and then to be able to say, great, I can revert at any time is really powerful. So we can go further with our pipelines, though. Um, it doesn't just have to be, great, build the application and deploy it. Once we have the basics in place, we can start going further with these things. Now, I'm not going to dive too deep into any one of these, because they could be talks in and of themselves. Um, but these are terms and things you should be aware of, um, if only to like, oh, I should research that more, or that seems like a perfect use case for our, our team. Uh, there's a concept of blue-green deployments. Now, this is a more advanced deployment scheme, um, but the general idea is that we have multiple production environments. In this case, blue and green. So two identical things. They could be running on the... Well, typically, they're going to be running on the, the same data center, but different. Um, basically, one is... Uh, well, let me walk you through it. So we have multiple... Uh, production environments, and this could be a single server each, or this could be a cluster of servers each. Um, and half of them are going to be active, meaning they're serving live production traffic, and the other half are going to be idle. Um, there's going to be a load balancer sitting in between, so we're saying, great, right now all of the traffic is going to blue, and green is just kind of hanging out. It's ready at a moment's notice, but it's just hanging out. When we have a new release ready, we're going to deploy that to the green environment. We can access the green environment without going through the load balancer, uh, or we create routing rules so that we're seeing the green. Um, but we can test things out. We can run smoke tests. We can do whatever we need to to make sure that green is behaving how we expect it to. When we say, yes, this release is good, we're signing off on it, we go to the, the load balancer and we switch it over. So all of the traffic, instead of going to blue, is going over to green. They're seeing the latest version of the code. They're running the newest, latest, greatest version of the application. Blue then becomes idle. And then blue would be the target for our next deployment. So each deployment, we're swapping between them. If anything goes wrong after we cut over to green, we always have the previous version of the application running on blue, assuming we haven't rolled out a new version for, for staging a release. Um, so we have that backup. The downside to this is that we do have uh, two environments running at all times. Um, which could definitely be costly. But if you have like a, we release at the end of the sprint, um, so you know we need to make sure that everything is good and we have planned releases, blue-green can be really effective, especially if it's a mission-critical application that you can justify doubling your hardware expenses. Um, we could also look at it as kind of a shell game. Uh, we're just quickly swapping blue and green, or Homer and Krusty, however you prefer to name your environments, uh, making sure that um, traffic just seamlessly flows to whichever ones are meant to be live. I mentioned earlier, uh, some people prefer to build Docker images, but we don't want to have to necessarily build those on our local machines. That's not something a developer needs to necessarily do because we want to make sure that it's being done in the same way it's following tagging rules, maybe change logs are being generated, all of that stuff. Um, so we can use the CI pipeline to literally build our Docker image for us. Again, anything that we need to do, we can script through our pipeline. So maybe the final product, rather than being a deployment, is a new tag of your application uh, that then gets pushed up to Docker Hub. Um, these can be really nice, excuse me, 
if you're working with any sort of uh, like Kubernetes or Rancher or anything like that, where you're um, wrangling a bunch of containers, um, because then you can start doing canary releases. You can say, great, I want to route 10% of traffic to the new version of the application, the latest tag of that release. If no one complains when we route 10% of the traffic there, maybe we bump that up to 20%. 30%, 40%, 50%, just slowly easing people into the new environment. Um, this makes it really easy uh, if you have a pipeline that's generating everything for you um, and handling all of, all of this process. Um, we can take advantage of our pipelines to also generate documentation for our application. If you're using something like JS doc, PHP documenter, um, Sphinx, anything like that, uh, to automatically generate documentation, you might say, great, as soon as we tag a new release, run this on the code, make sure that we have a new version of the documentation generated, push it up to wherever we're, we're hosting our documentation site, so as soon as you make that release, you have a new version of the documentation ready to go. That's one less step on maintainers uh, and lowering that barrier. Again, anything that we can script, we can run as part of the pipeline, which is really cool. We can also take care of things like code coverage reports. Um, a lot of CI pipelines will even have special things where it's not just like, oh, generate it and then write scripts to parse around it. It's basically like, hey, tell me what I'm looking for uh, and I'll parse this out. You can use this to create the, the coveted badges to put on readmes and stuff. Um, but you can also use this to figure out uh, if perhaps someone pushed code up uh, that isn't, that, that's lowering your code coverage. Um, if you're saying, great, we have like 80% code coverage on our app and someone pushes a new feature and it's like, and this branch has 60%, you could set up warnings around that and say, hey, this is actually going to negatively affect us um, if we're trying to get higher code coverage levels. Um, we want to flag that and we want to make sure people actually are writing tests for their stuff. Um, we can also handle notifications with our pipeline. Uh, GitLab CI/CD tooling supports webhooks, which means you can tie in to all sorts of different events. So if you want to do something like post to your Slack channel anytime new stuff goes live on production, um, you can absolutely do that. You could tag a new release in your analytics tool. You could send an email uh, to team members or to uh, support to say, hey, a new version of this just dropped and you know, here's where to visit to get the change log and here's all the updated documentation. Again, all of this stuff we can script. This isn't magic. Nothing we've talked about tonight is some like voodoo, like, well, how did you do that? It's all just a matter of when this happens, do this. If this fails, don't continue on. Don't do that. Does that make sense? Awesome. So congratulations. You are now all experts in CI, CD, or at least have the terms to look for, the, the understanding of, of what we want to pull off.